Self-Directed Learning, Part 3, prepared by Dr. Sean Bullock. This video podcast is protected by a Creative Commons copyright notice. Part 3, Facilitating Self-Directed Learning. We begin this video podcast series by taking a brief look at the history of formal research into self-directed learning. Then we examined some of the models of self-directed learning and found that, although self-directed learning was initially conceptualized as a linear progression through stages, current theories favor thinking about self-directed learning as a more interactive process between a number of internal and external factors. In particular, we found the model put forward by Garrison to be quite robust, as it takes account of a number of cognitive and metacognitive factors, as well as the transactional orientation to teaching and learning that is the goal of many adult educators. In this final video podcast in the series, we turn our attention to instructional models associated with self-directed learning. Now have a look at the two images on the screen. They both present fairly different images of teaching and learning. The image on the left, one might argue, is a fairly traditional image that might be associated with the teacher. It's quite quite clear that this is a picture of a teacher. There's a chalkboard in the back. Uh, There are desks at the front and uh, he's being presented as a source of knowledge. Whereas in the image on the right, it's unclear which of the two women are the teacher in the situation and which one's the learner. Although I can tell you that there is a teacher and a learner in that particular situation. At first, it might seem a bit strange to even begin a discussion about the role of teacher or educator or instructor in self-directed learning experiences. After all, isn't the whole goal of providing self-directed learning experiences to encourage learners to take ownership over all elements of the learning process? Well, that's certainly true, but let's take a moment to reconsider the thoughts offered by Stephen Brookfield mentioned in part one of this series. Quote, a recurring theme of research in this area is the way learners move in and out of learning networks and consult a range of peers. The key point is that whether or not learners choose to be temporarily isolated from or immersed within peer networks is the learner's decision. Indeed, in self-directed learning, all decisions about how and what to learn and how or whether to consult external resources rest with the learner. In the context of a self-directed learning effort, it is quite possible for there to be periods in which the learner decides it is most effective to place himself or herself temporarily under the control of an expert. From this perspective, we see that the role of the teacher, educator, instructor, or facilitator can be critically important in a self-directed learning experience. Joe Groh offered his theory of staged self-directed learning, or SSDL, in a 1991 issue of Adult Education Quarterly as an outline for considering how teachers could help their students become more self-directed. At the core of his thinking was that, quote, students have varying abilities to respond to teaching that requires them to be self-directing. It's probably simplest to view Groh's model in chart form. Here I've reproduced some features of a chart provided in his original article on page 129, and you see the stages Lifted down, uh, listed down the uh, left-hand column, and as well as characteristics of the learner in the center column, and the associated characteristics of the teacher in the right-hand column. Let's look at stage one first. Stage one learners need to be told everything about a learning task. What to do, how to do it, what resources to use, and how to manage their time. Here, teachers are the experts. Some students prefer this type of process both because of clarity and familiarity. It should be noted that even learners who behave consistently in self-directed ways are often at stage one, at least temporarily, particularly when they are asked to learn about ideas outside their expertise or experience. Thus, at some point or another, we are all dependent learners. The question is whether or not we behave exclusively in this fashion. Grow refers to stage two learners as being, quote, available, interested, or interestable, and that they respond to motivational techniques. The onus is on the teacher to hook students into discussions in response to engaging lectures. Teachers work hard to link course content to students' interests. Although learners at this stage might be motivated, they tend not to know a lot about the subject matter under consideration. Grow highlights stage two as the place where much of the, quote, unquote, good teaching occurs at elementary, secondary, in tertiary education, and indeed in the workplace. Often teachers who hone their techniques specifically for stage two learners rely considerably on their own enthusiasm and charisma. Stage three learners, quote, have skill and knowledge and they see themselves as participants in their own education and they're ready to explore a subject with a good guide, but they may need to develop 
a deeper self-concept, more confidence, more sense of direction, and a greater ability to work with and learn from others, end quote. They require instruction about how to improve how they can learn. In other words, they need to find ways to develop their metacognitive capacity. In this stage, teachers are facilitators who involve learners in an increasing amount of the decision-making for learning experiences. Teachers become participants in the learning experience, often navigating the vast terrain of a particular subject with a group of learners and dividing up areas of common interest for further study. The stage four learner is truly self-directed in that she or he sets goals independently. Grow argued that self-directed learner, learners, quote, use experts, institutions, and other resources to pursue these goals, and that learners at this stage are both able to and willing to take responsibility for their learning, direction, and productivity. A self-directed learner tends to be someone who prefers a high degree of autonomy. Although self-directed learners tend to be successful with any number of teaching practices, they tend to prefer a relationship with teachers that they can s consult with when they, have, uh, and when they encounter difficulties. Grow highlighted a number of teaching roles that are appropriate for stage four learners, including both consulting and mentoring. The focus, though, is to, is to be on the learner's development. As Grow noted, quote, the goal of a stage four teacher is to become unnecessary. Now, Grow's work was criticized by some for being overly critical of more traditional teaching approaches. He devotes a lengthy portion of his model to a discussion of the negative repercussion for the quality of students' learning when there's a mismatch between teaching approaches and learning strategies. Gross' perspective was inherently humanistic, a perspective which, as we discussed before, favors self-improvement and self-development as the goal for human beings. Gros himself stated that six of his assumptions at the outset of his, at the outset of his paper. Germain to this discussion are his assertions that the goal of the educational process is to produce self-directed, lifelong learners. Many current educational practices and in public schools and universities, however, do more to perpetuate dependency than to create self-directed learners." End quote. He also said, just as dependency and helplessness can be learned, self-direction can also be learned, and it can be taught. End quote. Finally, he was quick to point out that, quote, the ability to, self -directed, to be self-directed is situational in that one might be self-directed in one subject, a dependent learner in another. And finally, Self-directed learning is advantageous in many situations and this model is built upon a strong belief in its value, but there's nothing inherently wrong with being a dependent learner, whether that dependency is temporary or permanent, limited to certain subjects or extending to all." End quote. Now even with all these assumptions stated at the forefront, it's difficult to read Grow's work and not come away with the very strong sense that he believes that the goal of any educational experience should be a move towards self-directedness. Compare this assertion with some of the criticisms of the idea of self-directed learning discussed in earlier video podcasts. In keeping with a recurring theme in this video podcast series, another common critique of Grow's work is that it did not explicitly include a move towards social action as a central goal of self-directed learning. Researchers such as Hammond and Collins contend that the ultimate goal of self-directed learning experiences is to quote empower learners to use their learning to improve conditions under which they and those around them live and work end quote. Now we have seen that educators have a role to play in the self-directed learning experience whether or not we take Grow's model to heart um, but even if we accept Grow's model we, we need to find a role for the educator teacher or trainer at every stage in the process even stage four Brookfield here is helpful by reminding us that, quote, even when the majority of learning decisions clearly rest with the learner, educators can still play an important role. He goes on to categorize the contributions made by educators to self-directing learning projects in the following ways. Number one, educators have a role in helping learners determine the types of learning experiences they wish to take, undertake. Number two, educators can help learners find and determine the value of resources that might be useful in completing the learning project. Number three, the educator can help with the design of a learning plan. Number four, the educator might provide some direct instruction at various points in the learning experience at the request of, of the learner. Number five, an educator may act to mediate contentious issues that arise for a learner or group of learners. This is particularly important in uh, self-directed learning groups. And finally, number six, educators are often sought out, sought out to provide a critical assessment of learners' progress. There are many similarities between the kinds of roles that both Brookfield and Grow see for educators in the self-directed learning process. As we discussed in the first video podcast, 
the image of a ship at sea where the learner sails unencumbered from destination to destination in complete freedom is not entirely accurate. For effective learning to occur, even a self-directed learner must be willing to seek out assistance from an educator from time to time, although this relationship might turn into a kind of critical mentorship rather than a traditional teacher-student relationship in which the teacher is seen as the keeper of knowledge. One of the difficulties of producing a video podcast about self-directed learning is that it will by necessity by necessity be linear, at least in a temporal fashion. That is, one slide will follow another, which unfortunately might give the impression that self-directed learning is a linear process. Of course, we've seen many examples to indicate that self-directed learning is indeed both dynamic and transactional. That is, it relies on the interactions between the learner, peers, the educator, environmental contextual factors, and the cognitive and metacognitive processes of the learner. Creative Commons Copyright Notice. This work by Dr. Sean Bullock is licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 3.0 Unported License. You are free to share, copy, distribute, and transmit the work under the following conditions. 1. Attribution. 2. Non-Commercial. 3. No Derivative Works. This license may be viewed in its entirety at the web address listed on the screen. Thank you.